Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to another episode. And today, if you're joining us on YouTube, I mean, you already know what's coming. We have a four four square panel. We're like a couple guys short of playing Hollywood Squares. I'm just realizing this. This is a, a lot of activity. Uh, the legendary longtime podcasting team. Now they're no dunks. They've been the starters. They've been the basketball Joneses. You guys, there's probably stuff that I can't even remember that you guys have been. Um, from the No Dunks podcast, J.E. Skeets, Tass Mellis, Trey Kirby. How you guys doing? We're fantastic. We're good. Yeah, I guess we Very were good. the free agents for seven episodes wow. in between uh, the starters and no dunks. I was going to say Ben was correct. Three for three. Totally forgot about the free agents, which <laughs> yeah. did exist for a month and there a was half a li- or something. There was a brief limbo period there. Yeah. Um, also, I was wondering if we were going to get a hey from Trey, if he does it on the road, if he does road introductions like that. Hey-o! <laughs> Hey-o! <laughs> Um, Always guess, happy to throw one in, for sure. I guess I have to reciprocate. That that's very true. Um, you guys were you guys were in Indianapolis this weekend, and you enjoyed <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the legendary festivities. We'll be talking about the Indianapolis All Star Weekend till the end of time. It's like, <laughs> do we need to talk about this? Do we, do we need to discuss the All Star Game itself, All Star Weekend? How? What was the vibe there? What was it like? Were, were people as? Uh, Maybe disappointed as some of us were at home. I oh. okay. I'll get us started. I'm just happy we took a week off as no dunk, so we <laughs> didn't have to talk about the crappy actual All Star game. But we had a blast. We did our live show on Friday night, and then did a little sort of post recap podcast for the Saturday night, which was you know we were there. I think we overall gave it a B. Obviously, Steph versus Sabrina was pretty special. Um, but yeah, the game itself, uh, <laughs> uh, we were there. I'm not sure I watched more than three minutes of it uh, in terms had more fun uh, sort of talking to people. But yeah, the discourse about it is sort of out of control right now, I think. When people ask, "Did you? how did you like All-Star? I say, we had a great time uh, <laughs> because I kind of think Anthony Davis nailed it with regards to the game. Afterwards, he was asked what he thought his favorite moment was. And he said it was the Bulls and Pacers trampoline dunk team, which wasn't shown on TV. Maybe it was just during a timeout. It was definitely something that got the arena hyped. That was just an event during the All-Star game. Nothing from the game ended up being all that memorable. But uh, 211 points. That's a lot of points. (laughs) People were definitely disappointed all around us. Uh, They just... There, I felt like their shoulders were s- s- just salched uh, downwards after <laughs> the longer it went because it, it took so long to get going. That was the first thing. And the, the ball tipped 45 minutes after they told you to tune in. Right. And what's up with that? I mean, I'm a Canadian. I don't need to hear the Canadian national anthem. Babyface was awesome with the American national anthem. Keep him. Uh, but it just took so freaking long. Uh, the moments I found that were fun, yes. The dunkers, awesome. And were the moments that I looked on social media, they, you know, they showed Luca not being able to dunk on his. That was funny. It was really like social moments were the moments that I was going to remember from from the game. But Sabrina and Steph is probably the only thing we'll ever remember from this weekend, period. I, I don't, I mean, the glove, yeah, but I think we'll forget about that pretty soon. Yeah. You're probably right. <laughs> I, I saw a cut this morning of uh, Luca and Jokic like mic'd up and all the goofiness they got into. And then I was like, maybe they should just have them mic'd up on the loudspeaker in the arena. <laughs> and that can be sort of the shtick. But OK, seriously, here's my theory. Here's my theory about the All-Star <laughs> game. Um, our audience likes us to get back to brass tacks, but I have to nerd out a little bit about this. I don't think the All-Star game works anymore. And not for the obvious reasons, but the way basketball is played, it's very hard to have an exhibition game. Like the idea of an exhibition game 30 or 40 years ago is you could throw it in the post and you could do a hook shot or a spin or whatever. That stuff's less taxing on the body. The game today is like everyone's 40 feet away. You have to cut, screen, move. No one wants to do any of that. No one wants to hard hedge, switch, all these other things that you have to do. So it kind of destroys the idea of an exhibition game. That That's that's my theory. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think there's some truth to that. So if that's the case, then the NBA needs to lean heavily 
heavily into this isn't really a game. Let's get crazy silly with it. If it's four kids, that's awesome. Four point shots, five point shots, use this LED floor. Just get absolutely insane. Suddenly the mascots are on playing against these guys. Like just go, you know, you know, like just crazy with it. Um, don't pretend it's a game if we can't, you know, incentivize them to play or whatever and nobody wants to get hurt and you're right, it's taxing. They gotta veer the other way. Or just get rid of it. <laughs> I mean, if they're gonna do this half-assed game, it's a waste of everybody's time, including the players. It's either gotta be fun or competitive, and the last two have kind of been neither, so I'm with Skeets on this one. Competitive may have, the ship may have sailed. Uh, so perhaps we go rock and jock, find out what Bill Bellamy and Dan Cortez are up to, <laughs> throw a 25 wow. point wow. spot on the floor. You gotta get there to make your shot. I don't know what it is. And to Tass's point, Kids care. Kids still like it. So start it earlier so they can actually see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, that's a big part of it. <laughs> both both nights, uh, the the skills challenge was like an hour. And no one ever remembers it. We go into every All-Star Saturday night thinking, okay, that was fun. Oh, no, there's two more events as part of that skills challenge. <laughs> two more we, stages. We, we think it's done every single year. So, I mean, the Pro Bowl is is sort of my guide. I'm... I'm I, I see, yeah, the the random stuff where they, you know, they they hit that corner pylon, whatever the hell they do, you know, that type of stuff. But I don't. They don't have two nights like the NBA does, so that be that would be hard to do. Uh, I think the only the only remedy on Sundays is maybe playing four games in a way, like four quarter games, like we're playing till fifty, and that's a win, and we start a new game, and maybe guys will try a little bit. Uh, at the end of each quarter, because that's all you want is like some, some possessions with some defensive effort. That's that's all we're looking for. Like Yanis did have one possession after he told Damian Lillard, "Come on, we're the old guys. We got to show these guys." He did say that. That was great in the arena. He did have one possession where he was kind of bodying a guy on the three point line. It was more of a corner three point shot. So to your point, Ben. Yeah, like way up top. You can't guard anybody. So maybe in the corner for a second. Like they are still thinking about it a little bit. Maybe the quarters thing is the remedy for now before you just say, screw it. I, I, I like the shout out to the Pro Bowl because when I used to watch football and the Pro Bowl rolls around after the season, I don't remember the Pro Bowl. It's very hard to have like no. a good football game. But I remember... You have like the fastest man in the league competition where they're literally doing like 50, 60 yard dashes on a track. You have these quarterbacks throwing the ball as far as they can, which is endlessly entertaining. Like what? Randall Cunningham can throw the ball 82 yards. That's insane. <laughs> so like I think the NBA, if they could just get weirder and more random in that sense, uh, boy, it's, we, we're not even back from the all-star break and I sound like Mike Budenholzer. Let's get, <laughs> let's get random with all-star weekend. Um, all right. Unless you guys have more thoughts on this, let's let's shift to the actual second half of the season. Um, let's 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 be patriotic. Let's go to uh, Canada, the the team up there. Are they Why? Canada's team? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are, are they doing? That team up there? I I don't know. I don't know. What's that's what I want to ask you guys. What's going on uh, with the Raptors? That's let's just start with that. What's going on with the Raptors? Well, everyone just turned this off, Ben. Oh, my goodness. Now, you've got one of the biggest named free agents available in Emmanuel Quickly. He's a free agent, uh, and there isn't a lot of – it's not a great crop. So I do think that part's interesting. I think it might be a blessing in disguise that they stink um, because Emmanuel Quickly has to learn how to be a starting point guard for the first time in his career now. Uh, the Raptors gave up OG Ananobi for him and, and RJ Barrett. We know what RJ Barrett is. We've seen it. We've seen it now for years. We've seen it in Toronto. But Emmanuel quickly and him going to be a free agent is is really interesting because the guy can do it all. I mean, he can score so well uh, in every single way. But Tom Thibodeau didn't trust him to do that in, in in New York, and and now at times, I mean, he doesn't he, he doesn't look like he can figure that out along with Scotty Barnes. So I think it's just this this trial period where he's a starting point guard. His his legend, the guy that he idolizes, is Lou Williams. He's got to start stop playing like Lou Williams and start playing like a, a starting point guard. <laughs> and uh, Mo and, and Williams, the, yeah, Mo Mo starter. Mo, come on. 
Right. Al- Alvin Williams. We I'll can take, take all the yeah. Williams. Yeah. Yeah. Take an Alvin. Uh, yeah, because I, I think this is just it's just an interesting period for him and Scotty Barnes to play together. They stink. No one's watching. It's kind of good. Again, Thibodeau had him for, as a starter last year and decided, well, he had him for a portion of last year and decided this year, I'm not Quentin Grimes starting over you. Uh, and obviously, DiVincenzo starting over you. So they hit the bench, man. And uh, right now, as he goes into this free agency where other teams may be able to offer more or maybe willing to offer more, I do find this this next few months interesting because that's why they gave up OJ and Obi to the Knicks, is for this guy. RJ Barrett, yes, we are Canadian. Nice to have him there. Um, but it, it's all about this. So, I mean, the him and Barnes um, togetherness. That, that chemistry is really interesting to me. Barnes loves singing the national anthem as he did uh, at All-Star Game. That was cool <laughs> to see him. No no shots of Shea Gilgis Alexander as we heard the Canadian national anthem. What up with that? Uh, I don't know. But Scotty's in a great mood, but he also has to be – this is his time as well at being a number one guy for the first time uh, because of Pascal gone and, and Oji gone. So that's interesting to me, and it should interest other teams who may be willing to pay more than the reps. This therapy session is brought to you by no one because I did not know we were going to get on the couch today and uh, let the healing begin. Do um, you guys have any other other, other thoughts on, on the Raptors? I mean, I would just add what I'll be watching is, uh, you know, their win-loss record because they're battling the Grizzlies and, uh, you know, the Blazers aren't that far sort of, uh, you know, ahead if you want to flip it on its head there when you're looking at the records in terms of uh, the pick because Raps want it to be top six. If they're going to keep it, uh, otherwise that's going to the Spurs. So battling, you know, your Nets and I guess your sort of Hawks and stuff like that. Uh, they're 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 going to be leaning into yes, what Tass is talking about, growing quickly along with uh, Scotty and RJ. But I think when they're doing that, they're going to be hoping they don't win a ton of games uh, <laughs> and maybe help their chances of keeping their pick. So that's what I'll be watching. And the lottery is going to be exciting. It's going to be invigorating. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Get um, excited about lottery balls. I've been there. At least you don't have a Jim Boylan atop uh, the leadership. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So if we look ahead to the rest of the season, what is like one one big thing you guys are looking at? Top of the standings, player performance, getting set up for the playoffs, whatever it is. What is one big "Quote unquote second half." I like how we call it the second half. There's like 20 games left <laughs> yeah. in the yeah. season. That's um, also why they don't try in the All Star game. They're tired. Yeah, <laughs> the season should be played our 58 games. So, what's one thing you're looking at uh, with the last six, seven week stretch run of the season coming up? Trey, you go first on this. One of the biggest question marks I have is the Timberwolves offense because obviously Anthony Edwards is a bucket. Carl Anthony Towns is having his best season. We just saw him put up 50 in the All-Star game. The guy can (laughs) obviously score 31 points in the fourth quarter. Crunch time? Are you kidding me? But that has been a question for Minnesota is their fourth quarter offense. They are locked down defensively. You want Rudy out there. You want Towns out there. But sometimes things can get clunky, especially if McDaniels is on the court as well. To be a real championship contender, those are questions I think that they're going to have to answer in the final 25 games, getting efficient shots, uh, keeping their decision making above board. You know, I think that's a huge part of why Conley is sticking around in Minnesota as well. He's just such a settling and calm influence for them that I think there are times when he just really needs to take over for that team, just making sure they're getting the right shots. So his health is going to be really important going forward because the Timberwolves are a team that could easily get to the conference finals, but they've got to iron some things out uh, when it comes to crunch time. Any, anyone else want to jump in with the – or we want to riff <laughs> on the Timberwolves? I have, I have more to say on that if you want. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I, I think – we all agree that they're basically an average offense, right? That's their statistical profile. It's what they look like. And then even if you look at the personnel they have, I mean, Nas Reed, we love Nas Reed around these parts. He does mm-hmm. nice things off the bench. But in terms of like big playoff needle movers, what you're going to get in the series, I, I think you covered it, Trey. I think it starts with Anthony Edwards and then it's Carl Anthony Towns. How much can you get against them, against elite kind of defensive coverages and personnel in the playoffs that's a big question because if you're going to make a deep run in the playoffs if you don't have 
literally one of the best defenses of all time, you can't historically do it with an average offense. And so it kind of puts like a, a governor or a limiter on your ceiling. And I think that's kind of where I'm stuck with them, where they're like very good. But how can I put how can I consider you an inner circle team if you don't have that extra offensive firepower? Yeah, yeah it is. It is a blast uh, just watching them even go from three quarters and their performance to the fourth quarter because they they stopped moving the ball. They're like 30th in passing uh, this year in passes per game and their offensive efficiency kind of drops off because the ball starts getting a little sticky. And so that, I think Conley is is really important um, to just making that thing work in the fourth quarter. And Monte Morris uh, is going to be you know, a kind of a guy that they rely on to just keep things going as well as a, as a backup guard. So that's that's important. Um, and I, I I just went silent there because I thought I had my therapy session. That's that's all I paid for was like <laughs> that 15 minutes. So I'm out. I'm out on here. Thanks, Taz, think, for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, the Western Conference is like trying to wrap my head around what's going to happen in, you know, in a potential uh, postseason run with all these teams at the top because we're at the case where it's like, look at the Minnesota Timberwolves. They're at the top. OKC, the super young, exciting uh, a team in second right now. Then you've got the Clippers who are like, oh, well, yeah, if everybody's there, they have a chance, but no one's ever there. So it's like three teams with – because of limitations offensively, because of their youth, because of generally their health, where you're left going like, uh, it's like it's going to be a nightmare trying to predict some of these series, I think, because these other teams, these more sort of, you know, legacy teams, more established teams are lower in the standings. And, you know, in theory, they could be all matched up. So it's going to be, it's going to be tougher until you, it's one of those things, everybody hates it, but it's like, I know Timberwolves fans were upset with us right before we went to break because we were like, the Timberwolves deserve more attention, probably, but do you really believe in them? You know, to really right. make a really yeah. deep run and go to a conference finals or go to a finals, and it's like everybody goes, ah, uh, probably not until I see it. So, like outside of Denver, you know, defending champs, proven, healthy right now, uh, there's so many questions around a lot of these other teams, which makes it exciting. Don't get me wrong, but sort of tough to figure it out. So there are four teams clumped at the top of the West. Uh, Minnesota is in the lead right now, but Denver all the way down to four is only a couple of games behind. Right. How, how much do you think home court even is going to make a difference when we get to, you know, May and stack up a second or third round series and say, like, is it really important for Minnesota to have that one seed or does it does that extra game not really matter that much based on your point, like how fluid and possibly confounding the matchups are between all these teams when you start like you're like okay how does how do the clippers match you know how does how does this all fit together i think it means a lot more for these unproven teams to have you know that home court than it does like a nuggets or you know if the warriors make a run or obviously the lakers make a run and try and get in there like they've shown us before that's not you know the be end, end all of uh, you have to have home court advantage to advance not for them but those other teams those younger teams those unproven teams like i said i think there'll be some some battling some jockeying to uh to stay each other stay ahead of each other in the seedings to hopefully have that potential game seven at home because you know the kings had game seven <laughs> over the warriors last year and it unfortunately didn't matter i mean put up a good fight but um those those battle tested teams they don't seem to care i think personally i don't know if trey thinks otherwise or Tess. Well, at the very least, I would say that if you're one of the teams at the top of the Western Conference, you want to keep Denver out of the one seed. They didn't lose in the playoffs at home last yeah. year, right? Yeah. So if you can take game them on in a finals. game. Okay, game two of the finals. But uh, yeah. so what? They That's ran it. through however it, many it was wins up the until heat. then. It doesn't count. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the heat would but, beat the 96 Bulls. It's, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you do not want to play them in Denver in a Game 7 if you can avoid it. So I think uh, certainly Minnesota and OKC want as many home games as they can handle. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, oh, go ahead, Tess. No, yeah, Denver, yeah, the, the teams that haven't been there, for sure. Denver doesn't care. They're, they're going to win everywhere. Uh, the only team of all those legacy teams that would – really really benefit by having a home court series is the lakers they just stink on the road i don't know they've how. probably got the nine seed game though <laughs> they've got, that's they're true. looking good for hosting that it's a, that's a strategically a good spot to be in over the years <laughs> mm. <laughs> um the thunder they also added gordon hayward of course at the deadline right they have like this very interesting mix of are 
are they really a new team? It's very weird to think that Shea Gilgis Alexander hasn't played a playoff game <laughs> since 2020 and Chet Holmgren's 21 and it's like all this young talent, but also there's like a little bit of, wait, I remember Lou Dort taking 17 threes, the playoff, <laughs> playoff hardened <laughs> Lou Dort right. uh, taking down James Harden. So, you know, same thing there. By the way, great point on Denver, I think additionally because they have the altitude. So historically oh, yeah. we see... Uh, Utah and Denver and across sports, all those high altitude places. But, you know, OKC doesn't have altitude. They have very loud, passionate fans that like to stand quite a bit. Um, so you guys, you guys have any thoughts on them? Oh, I They've got, also I got the them. power of prayer. So that can take <laughs> them over the edge sometimes uh, as well. I literally wish that the Thunder had gotten swept in the playoffs the first round last year because then you can look at this team who has been dominant the entire year with an MVP candidate and two stars around them and role players that make sense. And then you can be like, well, at least they've got a little playoff experience. We've seen them. They competed. Who cares if they lost? But now they're going in, like you're saying, Ben, basically a fresh team, though Shea and Dorian do have some deeper five years or four years ago experience but if they even played in the playoffs last year I think we're looking at them more realistically as a conference finals contender just because we've seen them go through the toughest moments uh, I like how you mentioned Lou Dort there Ben because everybody when they look at Gordon Hayward they say well he's going to take Josh Giddy's minutes and that's definitely possible but he could also take Lou Dort's minutes because Lou Dort's quite often, yeah, it gets a little cold, uh, those 17 <laughs> shots. And Gordon Hayward's going to be on the perimeter, and Josh Giddy can do a little bit more of the uh, dribbling uh, than Lou Dort can. Although, you know, they both play defense. This is, this is a fun team. I mean, to have, yeah, deeper than than those starter five, it's, it's awesome. Well, they're going to make them shoot, I think, is what I'm excited to see in the playoffs. And so... Technically, Dort is a better shooter than Giddy. But yeah. to your point, the interesting thing with Hayward is if you run a lineup of Chet Holmgren, Gordon Hayward, Josh Giddy, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Jalen Williams, you basically have your five point guard dream <laughs> scenario, right? Like yeah. all those guys can touch, attack, pass. Uh, Dort doesn't really do that. So maybe you're trading off shooting, but I'm I'm interested in how often we see that kind of lineup with the playmaking and that kind of like diverse ball handling yeah they're to me like and i don't say this because i'm a huge shea fan he's canadian and all that and it's going to be at least in the conversation for mvp and rightfully so but they are so fun to watch you just went through their tight team i mean all those guys are, are, are a blast uh and they're good on both sides of the ball that's the other part like they're they're great offensively they're great defensively i think they're third in net rating right now um it's just we got to do we always do that thing and trey said he spoke to it it's like yeah, but this is the NBA. You got to take your lumps in the playoffs before it's like your year. So they feel like a year, like this will be their year to win maybe a series, to win another one. And that's sort of like, that's this. That's the, the ceiling they can do because they are too young and do not have the postseason experience. A lot of times that is true, but every once in a while we have those breakout sort of like, whoa, this team just sort of jumped from, from here to near the top and make sort of a conference finals run. And I, I'm... I'm hard pressed to see why it couldn't be them from what we've seen through the first 55 games or so. If you watch them, how good do you guys think Jalen Williams is? Oh my god, he's, I think he's awesome. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I love him. I love we, him. He, we, he's gonna we, be an all star. Well, we internally were talking about whether because we did our uh, annual sub all star podcast last week. We had him as a sub all star, but after the show. Cody, uh, the, I think the Thunder played, and he texts me, and he's like, "Are you sure Jalen Williams just isn't already?" you know operative word like trending toward an all-star and I'm like no I'm not sure he every time there's a big game or a big moment he's absolutely fantastic so uh I I hear the like you have to go up the pecking order kind of thing but I don't know actually where that puts their ceiling because I think they're pretty stacked and um you know going from no playoffs to conference finalists. We've seen that. I mean, the 2015 Warriors, yes, they won a series before, but it's a similar kind of thing where you're like, they are a first roundish team and now they're winning a title. And going one or two series in the playoffs versus winning four series is a massive jump. So we do kind of see this stuff occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the we makeup also saw of the their... Cavs last year, though, right? They had four yeah. all-star caliber players. They were great during the regular season and then they had one key disadvantage that the Knicks take, took advantage of by just pounding them on the glass. Jared Allen said, 
the lights were brighter than expected. I don't expect expect that to be the case with any of these Thunder guys. They seem like they're raring to go, uh, but you just don't know. It's true. Yeah, yep. I was just I was, I was just going to add to that. Like, um, they're a young team, but they hold themselves like a mature team. And maybe that's like sort of the way Shea is and like the rest of them. Like, what was that interview, TK, right before the break? Uh, you know, on the floor, they like to all huddle in there. And they're sort of asked about this idea of like being young. And, you know, they're just like, you know, yeah, like we'll see. Like they're not like they're not riding too high right now. They're not full of themselves. They they they, they obviously have a ton of confidence in their coach and and themselves as a as a squad here. So I mean, that's that sneaky that sneaky confidence gives you some like oh yeah maybe this is that breakout team like you said Ben where it happens every once in a while that they sort of just jump to the next plateau. Yeah, and uh, Jalen Williams gonna gonna love playing against Denver. Having been born there just gives them an advantage. <laughs> I will ne- I will not pick against the Nuggets, um, no matter how great OKC looks in Series 1 or 2 and have to play uh, Denver after that. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's obviously... Uh, I wonder what you guys think about where is it a, a great season for the OKC if they win one series? Is that is that good enough? Because I... Cause I they need to win one. It'd be very disappointing uh, if they didn't win a playoff series, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One is good, I feel like. I mean, uh, is, is I mean, good they, enough, I think I a great season is going to the conference finals. If they make it to the yeah. conference finals, you're looking at them coming into next season yeah. as a championship contender, if not favorite, depending on how things play out. So uh, anything less than one series win, disappointment, getting to the conference finals or further, uh, incredible. Yep. I think it also depends on who they play in that second round. Like if you play Denver in the second round and you take them to six or seven games, that has a different feeling than if you get swept Mm -hmm. by the defending champs. So, um, you know, we saw this with the 2008 Hornets. That's a team they've been compared to a lot where the 2008 Hornets take the defending champ Spurs to seven. And there's sort of this optimism of like, this is the direction the future goes in the 2012 Thunder, same thing. Um, and the Thunder almost did it like in linear fashion, right? Like the 09 yeah. Thunder were terrible. The 2010 Thunder made the playoffs and I think won 50 games, but lost to the Lakers back-to-back title Lakers teams. But also it was like competitive. Yep. And then in 2011, it was like, oh, we're on the brink. And in 2012, they actually make it to the finals. Um, so you see it go in different directions. But I-, I think it depends on who they play in the second round and and what that looks like. And they very well could make the conference finals and um yeah i think that would be a success of course yeah or you're the 2021 hawks battling the milwaukee bucks in in the conference finals and then never really smelling much in the playoffs ever again uh hopefully that'll turn so so negative this morning yeah 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 i'm telling yeah just got to man (laughs) 2021 Um, weird year man hawks and mavs (laughs) made the conference finals crowds were not completely there yet it's just a weird year the uh, the Clippers. What do you guys think? Well, let me let me rephrase the question. I, I I gave my answer to my own question. If there's a team, if there's a team you think can knock off Denver, who is it? Is it multiple Ooh. teams? You can't ask me because I'm just going to start being a negative Nancy right off the bat. Here. Okay. Uh, I I mean I'm worried about the Clippers and their size, and so as soon as you say Nuggets or the Wolves. I just I worry about that front line of Kawhi, Paul George, and a Zubat slash Plumley against monstrous Minnesota or monstrous Denver. I think that's 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 the really tough one that I'm excited to watch for in in any round really. But who who can do it? Hmm. Yeah, the Timberwolves handled the Clippers small lineup pretty well uh, right in the last week before the All Star break. Part of that is because Kawhi didn't play all that much in the second half of that game, and he ended up sitting the next game out. But uh, their small lineups look a lot better when he's uh, one of the five that's out there compared to Amir Coffey, obviously. Um, But that feels like it's going to be a game about math. It seems like you got to have some size to take down the Nuggets, which is why the Timberwolves have been talked up so much this year. They gave them a few competitive games in the first round last year, so you see the blueprint alongside the Lakers – who play everybody 6'10 and up from their 3-4-5 positions. I don't know if the Clippers will be able to flip the math on Denver because they're such a good scoring team as well, but the Clippers are such a hard team to figure out because 
you look at the players, you look at the personnel, they're a deep team. They seem to know who they are. They've got a good coach. They've got a finals MVP. They've got multiple MVPs. And it's just a question mark of who's going to be healthy and who's going to be performing. Yeah. And to answer your question, Ben, if I had to pick like the best chance to beat the Nuggets in a, in a Western Conference uh, matchup, um, I'm probably going to go, as crazy as it sounds, I'm going to go the Wolves uh, for some of the reasons TK said. They've played a, like they've had the weirdest schedule against them this year. They played once at the start of the season, took care of Denver. You know, Jamal and Jokic played, all that. And then they're going to play like three times over the span of like three weeks, you know, starting in March at some point. Like, so basically at the end of the season. And who knows, like, are you guys sitting guys and stuff like that? So I'm not sure we'll have much idea from regular season matchups between those two. But yeah, the size of Minnesota at least uh, is something in their favor against Denver. But uh, ultimately, I'd be picking, yeah, the Nuggets to come out of the West from what we've seen. I, I buy that to some degree because I think the matchup thing is real. I mean, we mm-hmm. saw that in the playoffs last season. I think just even Gobert and his presence around the paint with what Jokic tries to do and the way he tries to take advantage of mismatches or passing angles or things like that, I think it is a little disruptive. And we saw it again early in the regular season. Can we have like a mini... Can we have like a no dunks level sidebar on what's up with the scheduling, the the clump scheduling? Oh. Have you guys discussed this? It's I think it's designed for to save travel and all this kind of stuff. But you get these very weird things that sometimes they're cute. Oh, we play, you know, the Bulls and the Bucks played eight times this week. It feels like, but sometimes it's kind of almost uh, confounding or or weird for us because we're like. We don't know what Minnesota Denver looks like because they only played once at the very beginning of the year. They're going to play a bunch more, but they might not actually be real games because they're all clumped up at the end of the season. Do you guys have like thoughts on this? Do you feel this sometimes when you're (laughs) trying to scout teams? Well, we've definitely, I mean, we've done this a long time now, like almost 20 years of podcasting, daily podcasting. And it feels like this year more than any other year, there have been many days on our show where like, what the hell is going on with the schedule? Like, why are there, you know, 12 games on tonight and then only two on this night? And yeah, why is this team playing this team a million times, but they haven't played this team? So I don't know if the other guys feel that way, but I know we've said that on the show. And I don't ever remember us being so like caught up in that. And maybe it was just, you know, weighted a little more equally or maybe, I don't know, we're just two in the weeds now. But it does feel that way to me, Ben. I agree with that. I don't know what's going on. I think it's a leftover from like the COVID scheduling years, right? Where they were trying to get you to play two close games so you didn't have to return to the same market again. It feels weird now, though. And like Skeets is saying, there are so many of these 13 game nights that when a six game night comes around, you're like, oh, this is just the perfect amount of games. (laughs) So I don't know if there's a way to like combine the 13 games and the two games and split the difference. That's what I would like. But uh, it can make it tough when you're going back and reviewing everything for a playoff series, because then you got to check into who played this game. Was it the second night of a back-to-back for this team? Did they travel in between? Uh, The regular season matchups don't often matter when it comes to the playoffs, just because things are so different. Um, And this year, I think that will be the case especially. Yeah, the the weirdest part to me, Ben, I I, looking at a team schedule, for sure. The two-game baseball sets, which still exist that Trey mentioned there, it's beyond the beyond the weirdest for me uh, because it's it's the teams don't even need to win two games I, I don't think they feel like they they need to win both games and it's not really as desired for fans which it, yeah it's all about just exactly um less flight miles uh but it doesn't <laughs> doesn't feel right to me but it changes the dynamic a little too because if you see the team like in november and then you see them in january you're going through that night to night, like, okay, what's a brief scout? What's a walkthrough? Something like that. You play him back to back, and you're like, I just guarded this guy the other night. Okay, <laughs> I just saw this play the other night. And there are a ton of games where, or a ton of these little sets where, like, you watch the first pair of games, and then they come out in the second pair of games, and it's not a playoff series. They're not devoting the entire scouting team to it, but it's you can feel that it's a little different. I feel like it's probably harder to sweep that two-game block than it is if they were spaced out. What does that do to how we interpret the matchups and stuff? I'll tell you what it does. It confuses you if you're trying to make a Nikola Jokic video and they play the Raptors (laughs) on February 2nd and February 4th and the game is tied at 34 with four minutes left in the second quarter of both games. That's very, very confusing when you're looking for a clip (laughs) and you can't figure out why it's not there. Um, I I digress. That might have have happened to me recently. Um, (laughs) 
where were we? What were we talking about? The the playoffs, the uh, Western Conference playoffs. Do you guys do you guys buy any of the teams in sort of that second part of the bracket right now? We have the top four teams. They've created some separation, but then you have like the Pelicans, who are this really mercurial, like you know, are they super dangerous, talented, high margin of victory team? Phoenix is obviously sitting there. Dallas has made some moves at the deadline, and they're 32 and 23, which is you know four games back of Denver. Um, and then even the Lakers and the Warriors. The Warriors are making a move. Any any of these teams, we won't talk about Utah. My Jazz punted the entire second half of the season again. <laughs> any of these teams, uh, sort of, you think they have a shot of making a run? Did I miss it, or did you just gloss over the Sacramento Kings as well? I did. I, I That was not because I don't love the Kings. That was because uh, my eye scanning is terrible. Fair and, enough. Uh, yeah. yeah. So feel uh, free to include the Kings if you yeah, like. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I just say, you, I could hear the comments already. Uh, how could you not include the 31 and 21, uh, 23 Kings? Um, yeah, like... <laughs> The answer is yes, absolutely. I mean, especially, I'm a sucker. I always, it feels like any Suns game I watch, they look invincible. And uh, I'm like, oh, yeah, who's good? Like, we saw them, obviously, in, in the postseason last year. Just, like, the pure talent at the top being enough to win a few games. So I always get tricked into believing uh, in that team. But there's no doubt they're a nightmare to play against when all three of their guys are healthy. And Beal, I think, over the last little couple of weeks here is has started to look a, look a little bit more like the old Bradley Beal, um, which, which is a positive for Phoenix. But all those teams are good. I just don't see what the, the teams we've already talked about, I feel like, are just clearly a step ahead. Um, so that's good battles. You know, that 4-5 will be fun, like whoever's there uh, from the top team with the then the best team of the second group. But I'm not convincing myself it's the Mavs or the Suns or the Pelicans or the Kings or even the Lakers or Warriors that are going to make this incredible run this year uh i don't think so i'm ready to be lucy with the football with the dallas mavericks once again i'm always convinced they can win any playoff series they play in because they've got luca who could give you a 40 and 20 any single night and then kyrie irving is an incendiary scorer as well they've got role players that make sense with their team i remember thinking that going in the playoffs uh last season or i guess a couple of seasons now as well it just I don't know. They have such a high ceiling, the Mavs do. If everybody's hitting threes, if Luka's playing well, if Kyrie is on the court, that they look like a team who could beat anybody, but the consistency is a problem uh, for this team from a personnel standpoint and from a playing standpoint, but the talent level is just so high, and their top two guys are such good shot makers that it feels like they've still got deep runs in them. Yeah, uh, as far as the excitement level for that tier two, Mavs lead mine for sure uh, because they just seem way more fun since getting Gafford and P.J. Washington. They just feel like they're playing a a different game out there and Jason Kidd is uh, making them play a different game. Picks everywhere, but they're also intriguing to me because we saw what Luka went through in the offseason where it seemed like, does Luka really want to be here? And they've got so much money guaranteed in those guys I mentioned, plus Luka and Kyrie next year. It's like $170 million guaranteed next year. So if Luka walks off the court after a romp in, in the first round, I just wonder how it's going to look uh, next year. So I, I think that part's intriguing. I do think the Suns are the team that I would uh, stand behind if – if they're facing any any of the good teams because you know they've gone through so many injuries this first half and they're only a few games back of the Denver Nuggets and I also buy Kevin Durant at the five when they want to go mm. that Frank Vogel has been toying with that a little bit and the center spot there is always a little a little questionable for me uh, can you trust Yusuf Nurkic for 40 minutes well you can trust Kevin Durant with what he did for the Warriors at times in winning the championships. So this team that took two games from the Denver Nuggets last year, uh, and obviously it's different, but Chris Paul did go out in that series, and he was solid, uh, even though, uh, you know, the numbers aren't incredible. So, uh, yeah, the the Suns are are an intriguing bunch, but they also need to get more games together in the second half. And do you think... Do you think there's a team in the tier two, tier two as we're calling them, that will actually get into the tier one with, you know, uh, basically a little bit more than, you know, a quarter of the season left? Like, could you see the Pels or the Suns like catching one of those top four teams? Yeah, we discussed this on a recent episode, trying to 
pick like if is there a team you think can kind of make one of these explosive runs because the whole season has been like where did this team come from all of a sudden Utah wins 17 of 21 all of a sudden Cleveland like I I don't know if the basketball world has internalized that Cleveland is 36 and 17 right at the all-star break like they literally have basically the same record as the top seeds in the west it's just that they're sitting behind Boston in the east so is there another team uh, the Knicks have gotten hot I I think the Pelicans you know if I if I'm forced to pick it might be the Pelicans the Suns are interesting because as they kind of round into form and get new pieces, I mean, my big thing with the Suns is when we get to the playoffs, and you mentioned Kevin Durant at the five, I mean, Kevin Durant at the five might completely fall apart against a big team like Jokic and the Nuggets because like Kevin Durant guarding Jokic is just, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not really going to work. They might have to cook something else up if they want to try to go small. So for me, it's Phoenix being able to get more players and I think they did that a little bit at the deadline like just they need more basketball players like Grayson Allen being a competent basketball player has been massive and so when Bradley Beal comes back in the lineup he's in essence replacing someone who's I I don't know I don't want to be disparaging but like the 280th best player in the league or something instead of like a guy that would start on all these other teams I think that's big the overall lineups with Beal and Durant and Booker, it still hasn't clicked. And that, and so I'm sitting here like, I think it could click. I think they could kind of start to work some things together. So Phoenix is a team that could do it. Uh, New Orleans is a team that can do it. And they're only like three, three and a half games difference yeah. between it's that like, top group. It's like two weeks of good play from one of these teams and, and right. a bad injury to one of the teams above and it's exactly. suddenly you're flipped in the in the standings. Yeah, like if I had to bet, I don't know if it's a good bet to, to say that these top four teams will be our final four teams and these next four teams will be in the next four positions. And even to your point about Dallas, guys, like I, I love the Daniel Gafford trade. I love the addition of P.J. Washington. Now you're always going to have a paint protector, rim runner, pick and roll partner with Luka uh, he and Kyrie Irving, when they've been out there together, they've been good this year. They've mm-hmm. been like plus eight net rating kind of thing. And, you know, if you quickly turn around, they only played 600 minutes, so you could quickly ramp that up <laughs> if things go well. So, yeah, it's uh, the, the last couple seasons, the Western Conference in the NBA has just been crazy. And part of me thinks we're indexing too hard on Denver having a great run last year and taking for granted like how difficult it's going to be again to beat three of these Western teams in a playoff series. Yeah, that's hey. absolutely fair. But uh, <laughs> their top two guys are like, at least in the postseason when healthy in Jokic and Murray, teams have not figured out how to stop them. <laughs> it seems to be an issue because Jamal Murray just like, yeah, he's basically the Western Conference version of Jimmy Butler at this point where he just sort of goes nuclear uh, and along with Jokic, who's obviously the, the star of that team. But you're right. I mean, all, all these teams we just went through, they're, they're like even like, I know we're sort of joking like the Kings, we forgot to mention them, but they're, they are a good team and are going to be a tough team battle i think for somebody it's not going to be like a cakewalk so um man western conference is gonna be a bloodbath uh, yeah I, w- I do want to mention about the phoenix suns because i was thinking about the fact that they just need more minutes together period and i do remember hearing on, on a podcast that their strength of schedule is very difficult the second half and i, I looked it up and I, I went back to it again it is so hard they're in fifth right now i don't even think it, even though there are just three games back of the Nuggets, the fact that they play all of these like championship contenders twice, the Celtics, the Wolves, the Thunder, the Cavs, the Clippers, and the Nuggets the rest of the way, they have by far and away the toughest schedule. I, unless you want to flip it around and say, it's good getting those games in now <laughs> when they matter less, I guess. Uh, but I, I doubt they're going to get home court advantage against the Nuggets with that toughest schedule. It is by far and away the toughest schedule r- remaining. Yeah, that's that's a brutal schedule. Um, yeah, I, I would not want to face that. I'm just still thinking about Skeets talking about how no one can talk stop the uh, two man action of the Nuggets, and all I can think about is, but the Suns have three All Stars, and the Nuggets only have one All Star. You know, Jamal Murray apparently <laughs> is not an All Star. Um, 
if you guys haven't been following along with this shtick, I'm hoping he never gets named. He's so much better historically than the than the best non All Star player at this point. It's becoming right. like a running gag, especially when you consider how incredible he's been in the playoffs. So yeah, and he was asked about that recently. Like there was an article on the Athletic that there, he was asked, "Hey, do you think you're the best player ever to not be an All Star?" It's like, he, dude, he's friggin' twenty six. Like let him <laughs> let him live a little before you ask him that question. Uh, so no no Warriors believers or Lakers, Ooh. the California. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I thought we were gonna go a whole podcast without talking about this. <laughs> we can do it. We can do it. Yeah. <laughs> when it I comes mean, to play in teams, we're obsessed no. with the Eastern Conference, not yeah. the Western <laughs> Conference. But it's gonna be a star studded affair in the nine ten matchup. The Warriors look better. I mean, yeah. Draymond Green makes everybody better on both sides. Kaminga and Wiggins, nowhere to be defensively. Steph Curry gets easier shots. So, no surprise, the Warriors are a lot better. They'll be competitive in every series. It just feels like uh, they're not necessarily as reliable as they have been in years past. Even going back to the 2022 championship when they got 60-plus games from Otto Porter. Who's their Otto Porter this year? Like a random vet who's going to be productive for him in the playoffs. Good question. I don't, I don't know. Um, Gary Payton the second, maybe. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's let's uh, before you guys get out of here because we're gonna get the messages. Let's talk about the Eastern. Can you guys hear my dog? She's just very upset, and I know yeah. what she's upset about is that we haven't mentioned the Eastern Conference. Um, <laughs> in the in the Eastern Conference, is there a team that you know catches your eye? We've been talking about upward trends and sleepers and things like that. What? I'll, I'll open it up to the round table. Eastern Conference. I think the go- Eastern Conference depends on Chris Tapps Porzingis' health. That's it. Ooh, going right there. Absolutely. I don't see any of these teams. If he's playing. If he's playing and he's out there and uh, is healthy with the, the rest of the Celtics, I think they are clearly the favorites that I would be backing to come out of the Eastern Conference. If he's not, and that could be obviously the case, I guess he's played, what, 40 of their 55 games this year, uh, then it's a different story to me, but he's such a difference maker with obviously an already talented team that has playoff reps and stuff like that. So it's all it's like weird that it comes down to Porzingis for me <laughs> in terms of the Eastern Conference, but that's my feeling about it. You never know when you're getting an Otto Porter fully healthy season, Skeets. <laughs> That's right. If Chris Stapps is around, the Celtics have a chance. Uh, at this point, if you're talking expectations, I think anything short of the conference finals is a disappointment for Boston. And honestly, they should make the finals the way they've upgraded to a starting lineup that basically has five All-Stars in it. I'll admit to still being skeptical, though, because I think that they still are haunted by some decision-making in the fourth quarter and some settling. I think Jason Tatum's had his best year, uh, though maybe his like total numbers are down, but he seems to be able to get to the hoop, but sometimes he doesn't get to the hoop, and that's why Porzingis is kind of the key. It's a, it was a meme back in the day that this guy never posted up. Now they post him up all the time, <laughs> and he's realized he's 7'3". He can just shoot over everybody. That's a reliable weapon. Uh, for the Celtics that they didn't necessarily have when Marcus Smart was out there. So fourth quarter's kind of an adventure for the Celtics, I still think, but they've also (laughs) made things a little easier on themselves when they remember things are easier. Yeah, I don't know if they got Xavier Tillman at the trade deadline because Porzingis might get hurt. Uh, but uh, I start to I start to think of Xavier Tillman running up and down on that team and he's decent or maybe they uh, got him because Al Horford is old. Um, I, I don't know, but they have they just have so many guys. Um, so, other than Jason Tatum's ugly jacket uh, to to help Jalen Brown come second in the slam dunk contest, I believe in that guy uh, because uh, maybe because he's been so good for so long and he hasn't won, so people just aren't able to call him a superstar. Uh, but I think that bodes well for him. I think he he went obviously and got bigger and more uh, more tough in the off season. So I think he's ready for another postseason, which he keeps going deep and deep into the playoffs uh, as their number one guy. And I just I just don't see him letting up uh, and allowing a team to take them out in the Eastern Conference Finals again if they're healthy. I mean that does play a, a big factor. Wow. Okay. So I'm all in on Boston. Is there? Let's do it this way. Is there a team you think poses a legitimate threat if the cards fall the right way 
to take them out in a playoff series. And I'll, I'll just I'll go first. I think if Philadelphia gets the big guy back, that mm-hmm. would be my answer. Yeah, that's the question. What yeah, does you, Embiid look like if and when he comes back? Because if he's 35 points in 34 minutes, Joel Embiid, absolutely, they've got a chance. That guy makes 35 points look so easy. It's like he's shooting layups from 15 feet. And despite Porzingis's size, he's still giving up quite a bit of weight uh, to uh, Joel Embiid. Now Al Horford has been an Embiid stopper in the past. <laughs> Maybe that's uh, something they can reach deep into their bag for, but... Between Maxi's growth and the way Embiid was playing this season before he got hurt, that was a tough, tough team that seemed to already have an identity and know who they are and know what they're about. Whereas that was maybe a question mark they had after the second or after the All Star break last season. I'm I'm buying the Bucks. I know it's a way off base here, and they're three and seven under Doc, but I, I do like a team that can score in the paint against the Boston team. The only team the only time that I, I feel like Boston will get cold is when they just decide that they're only shooting uh and they kind of just rely on, you know, that that dribble up and maybe one, two, three passes and, and take an outside shot. And I think the Bucks can can be that team that forces them to be that way because they are a really, really huge team. So I it's not much. It's not much of a an advantage over Boston because they're a pretty big team themselves and they can play defense one through five. But uh, I just don't think we've seen the best of the Bucks quite yet. And uh, I, I do think I'm not, I'm not trying to sell the doc uh, new coach and what he can inspire, but I do think the team in the locker room is going to be tough to beat in the postseason. I would say the, Doc's been doing the opposite of that so far. <laughs> yeah, you, you mean the Bucks, the, just the Bucks personnel. Yeah. Yes, the Bucks personnel. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, they don't get a three-one lead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought Pat Beverly was a good coaching hire for them. <laughs> yeah, I think I think from a personnel standpoint, I think you can make the argument for Milwaukee. The, and then there's always the zombie uh, team in the Eastern Conference, yep. the Miami Heat. They're yep. just lurking and no one wants to play them so um we'll throw that out there guys before i let let you go how long have you been tracking wedgies Ooh, 10 years 10 years um, yeah and yeah. this is this we're on pace for a record this year is that right yeah it's um, a good good question uh yeah we've had 58 in two of the last three seasons as a record in the modern era and uh we're on pace for a 59er yeah. oh my whoo I have to say, from just my memory, which is very faulty, especially every day that goes by, it feels like wedgies are up. It feels like the style of play compared to 20 or 30 years ago has increased the wedgies. So it's unofficially a record, but I think we could probably say if we hit 59. I mean, it's like we're in baseball territory at this point. Can anyone get 60? Can we have a season of 60? (laughs) This wow. is the yeah. year. You'd have yeah. to go back to the 1960s to check because they were playing fast pace. They were getting a lot of shots up, but people hadn't figured out how to shoot from deep yet. So there could have been a lot of wedgies back then. True. We just don't know because I'm with you. There's more now than there ever have been. The pace is up. The three-pointers is up. We always say every three-pointer is like a wedgie or, uh, every, three, or every wedgie is like a snowflake, but that's not necessarily true. A lot of them are three-pointers that get stuck. You know, that's about 50%, it feels like to me. And if you're taking more threes, there's just bound to be more balls getting stuck. I also wonder if the basket design, because even back then, the the hoop, the mechanics of the way they designed the hoop were a little different. Have you guys yep. gone into this? This feels like it could be a no dunks documentary <laughs> that I might want to see later in the summer. The three of you guys explore the history of wedging. Yeah, look, it's all in play. Uh, you guys talked about the pace of the game for sure. Uh, let's, you know, the balls have changed in recent years too. There's that. Um, yeah, we're at 38 right now, so we are in pace for like 59, 60 when we get into the postseason. I think we're going to set the all-time record this year. I just looked it up because I'm with Trey. It's like it feels like a lot of them are three pointers this year. Only 13 of the 38 have been three-pointer wedgies. We actually had a lot of floaters uh, this year. So, um, yeah, just a small note there as we go to Mm wedgietracker.com if you want to follow all this. (laughs) And the the floater is, I mean, that's a shot that's far more popular today than it 
was way back in the day. You talk about the balls changing. I mean, it's there's a lot here. Like the ball used to be like a single panel. They didn't have like a multi-panel basketball. There's a lot going on. Um, thanks, guys, for stopping by. That was that was a lot of fun. I appreciate. Thanks, it. Ben. Appreciate thanks it. for having us. Yeah, if you want to support this show, check out patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball. Uh, we've got additional content, stats, all kinds of other things, a monthly Q&A, which we'll do coming up shortly. Otherwise, thanks as always for listening all the way through. And of course, I hope you are having a great day.